future. Um, I hope you can commit to doing the job the right way, and I think you can. The people who work in Washington, D.C. need to come in to serve all the Americans, from coast to coast and in the middle, Democrats and Republicans, management and labor. No matter what pressure comes from the extremes of the President's party, we cannot open the door of the Labor Department up to people who want to make enemies of job creators. And the Department's job is not to make trial lawyers richer at a time when many businesses are struggling just to keep their doors open for the benefit of their workers. The problem with slaughtering the golden goose is that it no longer lays eggs. America is in the midst of an immense domestic and international challenge. We have health challenges with coronavirus pandemic. We have challenges with international competition with China and others. We should be able to work together to address these challenges. We need a skilled workforce. We need to encourage more women and minorities into science, technology, engineering, and math. We need to ensure that management and labor never conspire to construct another unfunded pension plan again. We need to ensure America, America that government is here to assist, not to hinder the reopening of our economy, and the list goes on. Bipartisan solutions exist to all these problems, and if you commit to working together in a bipartisan manner with us, I'm sure the Senate will work with you. I'm particularly concerned about the unprecedented firing of the NLRB's general counsel. No president, no president has ever taken such action in recent memory. Not Trump, not Obama, not Bush, not Clinton, not Bush, but uh, not Reagan, or others before them. And it's a disturbing signal from an administration preaching the need for bipartisan unity. I would caution you in the administration that um, might doesn't always make right, and that you should be mindful that lurches to the left will be bad for a growing economy and getting people back to work. At one point in our history, the Department of Labor and the Department of Commerce existed together. Theodore Roosevelt knew that the interests of commerce and labor were ultimately aligned. Somehow, over the years, we've lost our way in that regard. Our largest economic challenges are external. As chairman of the Intelligence Committee, I learned that our competitors just don't play fair. We need to be on the same team. We need to battle for our economy, for our fellow citizens, not for philosophy. Samuel uh, Gompers, the founder of the American Federation of Labor, once said that a man who dwells on socialism, socialism forgets his union card. He told his socialist opponents, I quote, economically you're unsound, socially you're wrong, industrially you're Im impossible, unquote. These sorts of unsound, impossible political agendas he spoke of don't help the working people. They present the biggest sta standing threats to America's competitiveness. I implore you, do not be a party to that. As Teamsters uh, President Jimmy Hoffa pointed out, the political decision by President Biden to cancel the completion of the construction of the Keystone Pipeline resulted in the loss of 8,000 union jobs and the loss of members' retirements and health care benefits. I hope that when confirmed, you'll be in a adult voice in the room reigning in this type of politically motivated chaos. Chaos in that specific example, which cuts jobs and counterproductively increases, increases greenhouse gas emissions. I hope you can help us move beyond a class struggle mentally of 100 years ago and help us build a workforce for 2021 and beyond. We can no longer afford to operate as a labor team and a management team. We must be in this together. Tom Brady's proven that a Massachusetts guy can hop on I-95, go south, and do good things. If doing good things is your goal, and I think it is, you'll have an ally in me. But you've got to be willing to stand up to the agenda activists to get that goal. I'll join you Sunday rooting for Tampa Bay, not trying to suck up to the next Secretary of Labor, but because at my age, I root for the old guy, and that's where Brady is these days. 
I plan to conduct rigorous oversight, especially of the pandemic, uh, of the response to COVID-19. I'll ask fair, difficult, and probing questions on the decisions you make and the way the, the agency operates. I will expect honest, complete, and timely answers. I hope you can commit to working with me on that. Uh, despite the fact that, as mayor, you out-recruited my state of North Carolina for many of the jobs that should have come our way and they ended up in Boston, I expect by the end of this hearing, I'll be able to support your nomination and I will encourage my colleagues on this side of the aisle to support you as well. I look forward to this confirmation hearing. I thank the chair, I yield back. Thank you very much, Senator Burr. Uh, I will now turn to Senator Warren to introduce Mayor Walsh. Senator Warren. Uh, thank you very much, Chairwoman Murray and Ranking Member Burr, and welcome Marty and Lori. Uh, I am here to introduce Mayor Walsh, the mayor of Boston, Massachusetts, who has been nominated to be our next secretary of the Department of Labor. And I am really happy to be here. After four years of a Trump Labor Department that did its best to undermine workers, Marty will be a Secretary of Labor who actually supports labor. Marty grew up in a hardworking family in Dorchester, Massachusetts. His mom and dad immigrated from Ireland and worked hard in America to give their children more opportunities. His family's story tells of a deep-seated commitment to building opportunity for the next generation. It is one of the many reasons that I trust Marty to look out for everyone looking for a good job, a decent wage, and a chance for their kids and their grandkids to succeed. Marty's dad worked in the building trades, and Marty followed him into this work as a member of Laborers Local Union 223. Marty was smart, creative, and relentless and his fellow workers eventually elected him their union president. He later served as head of the Boston Buildings and Construction Trades Council, representing tens of thousands of workers in the region, and then on to the state legislature and eventually mayor of Boston. I trust Marty to look out for America's working men and women because he has a strong record of having done exactly that. As mayor, he fought for a $15 an hour minimum wage and paid sick fam and family leave. He prioritized racial and gender equity, creating an Office of Women's Advancement and an Office of Diversity to address disparities in pay, in leadership, and in opportunity. And he established a new cabinet-level position for a chief of equity to center equity and inclusive opportunity throughout all of city policy. Marty's response to the COVID-19 pandemic exemplifies his leadership. His administration worked to get PPE to frontline workers and to set up a field hospital in Boston's convention center. But Marty didn't stop there. He provided emergency childcare to first responders and healthcare workers, and he worked to create the Boston Resiliency Fund, to meet the needs of hard-pressed communities, including programs to hire laid-off workers. Given his record on fighting for workers, it's not surprising that Marty's nomination has earned the support of so many unions and worker organizations. As a longtime union leader, Marty knows what it's like to fight for fair pay, meaningful benefits, and safe conditions in your workplace. And I say this as someone who has worked with Marty for years. Deep down, he is a good man who believes that government can and should serve the people. And he lives by that belief every day. Welcome, Mayor Walsh. We are pleased to have you here. And I look forward to your nomination and your service to our nation. Thank you very much, Senator Warren. Mayor Walsh, welcome. Thank you for being here today. We are looking forward to hearing from you, and you can now begin your testimony. Thank you, Thank you very much, Chairwoman Murray. Uh, I appreciate your introduction. Ranking Member Burr, I as well want to thank you. However, um, 
Marty, hit that. How Marty, hit that mic, would you? I got a new start. I didn't know I did it. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Chairwoman Murray, uh, for your introduction. I appreciate it. Uh, Ranking Member Burr, thank you as well. I'm not sure how much you helped me out there today uh, with Senator Marshall. Uh, when you were talking about Tom Brady, he was looking at me, so uh, we'll have to work on that one later on as the hearing goes on. Um, I want to thank you also, Senator uh, Warren, my friend, for that kind introduction. Uh, I also want to acknowledge Senator Hassan, my neighbor and partner from New Hampshire, Senator Romney, whose administration I work with when he was governor of Massachusetts. I want to thank all the members of this committee for inviting me to speak today. I want to welcome the new members of this committee to your hearing today for the first time. Uh, and to the members that I've had opportunities to talk to, I've enjoyed our conversations over the last couple weeks and look forward to talking to all the members of this committee and getting to know you on a personal level. I want to thank President Biden and Vice President Harris for the honor of this nomination. I share their commitment to the health and safety of the working people carrying our country through this pandemic, this very difficult time. I share their commitment to building back better with an economy that works for every single American worker. In many ways, that has been my life work. Uh, as Senator Warren mentioned, my mother and father immigrated from Ireland in the 1950s. They both worked hard, but our American dream did not take shape until my father had the opportunity to join the Laborers Union, Local 223 in Boston. That union was my family's way into the middle class it meant a fair wage so we could grow, have security. It meant safety on the job site so we didn't have to live in fear of accidents derailing our lives. It meant a pension so my parents could retire with dignity. And that meant health insurance. At the age of seven years old, I was diagnosed with Burkitt's lymphoma, a form of cancer. It was every parent's worst nightmare. But with health care treatment and great treatment by doctors and nurses at Boston Children's Hospital, and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, and the prayers from nuns and priests on both sides of the Atlantic, I recovered. And I've had an amazing experience on my life's journey. As a young man, I followed my father into that union, into construction. I saw firsthand the sacrifices that working men and women make for their families each and every day. In my 20s, because of the same benefits that enabled my cancer treatment as a child, I wanted the treatment for alcoholism. I'm a proud member of the recovery community today. Later on, as a full-time legislator, I went back to college, earned my degree from Boston College at the age of 42 years old. I share these personal details because they help shape my understanding of struggling working people and families face each and every day. And they inform my deep beliefs in the work of the Department of Labor. Workers' protection, equal access to good jobs, the right to join a union, continuing education and job training, access to mental health and substance use treatment. These are not just policies to me. These are, I live them. Millions of American families right now need them. I've spent my entire career at different levels fighting for them. As a state representative for 16 years, I worked on economic development and worker protections in collaboration with four Republican governors and one Democratic governor. As general agent of the Metropolitan Building Trades Council, I work with developers and contractors to secure good jobs and major investments. I also help create a program called Building Pathways. It provides pre-apprenticeship training for union careers for people of color and women so their families can join the middle class the way that my family did. I believe everyone, including veterans, LGBTQ Americans, immigrants, and people with disabilities must have full access to economic opportunities and fair treatment in the workplace. For the past seven years, I've had the honor of serving as mayor of my hometown, Boston, Massachusetts. We've proven that we can create a world-class economy that works for working people. We secured a $15 an hour minimum wage. We expanded workplace training. We created groundbreaking policies to close gender wage gaps and increase racial equity. And businesses thrived as well. We attracted $43 billion of investment. We grew the base of jobs as an American major city by nearly 20%. We managed public resources responsibly, earning a triple-A bond rating for each of the seven years for the first time that's ever been done in Boston's history. And when COVID struck, we were ready to meet the needs of working people. We were the first city in America to pause construction. We work with employers and labor on strong COVID product protocols. That allowed us to restart safely and build the homes and businesses and infrastructures of a strong recovery. 
Throughout my career, I've led by listening, collaborating, and building partnerships. That's how, if confirmed, I will lead the Department of Labor. Right now, we are depending on workers, men and women, to keep us going, as they always have done, and, and we are always depending on them. I believe we must act with urgency to meet this moment with determination to empower our workforce and rebuild. If confirmed, I pledge to lead this work in partnership with workers and businesses, states, cities, and tribal territories, employees in every single agency of the Department of Labor, the administration, members of con Congress from all parties, and members of this committee. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much, Mayor Walsh. Uh, we will now begin a round of five-minute questions. I would ask my colleagues to please keep track of the clock and stay within those five minutes. I am very happy to stay if anyone would like additional questions in a second round. So, Mayor Walsh, let me begin. Uh, in my opening remarks, I noted the unprecedented challenges that workers face in today's economy. The economic impact of this pandemic has been especially severe for women, and in particular, women of color. While we work to address the challenges posed by the pandemic to workers, we also need to address systemic issues that have been swept under the rug, rug for far too long. Even before this pandemic, women were paid less than men for the same work and were more likely to struggle to find affordable childcare or be able to take time off to care for a sick family member. In the past few years, we saw the Me Too movement raise awareness of the harassment many workers face on the job because of their gender, race, sexual orientation, gender identity, disability, or religion. I introduced the Be Heard in the Workplace Act to address harassment, including sexual assault in the workplace. And I hope working with members of, of this committee on both sides of the aisle, we can make some progress on that issue. Building an inclusive economy means taking into account the needs of all workers and removing barriers that hold too many people back. So Mayor Walsh, as Secretary of Labor, I expect you would use the full authority at your disposal to respond to the impact the pandemic has had on women and um, workers of color and to deal with the longstanding barriers that create unequal opportunity in the workplace. Can you uh, give us some examples of how you have approached those issues during your time as mayor in Boston? Thank you very much, Chairwoman <laughs> Murray, for, for your comments and your question. Uh, I'm proud of the work uh, that we were able to accomplish in the city of Boston uh, through our Office of Women's Advancement and also the newly created Office of Equity in the city of Boston. Um, COVID-19 has, has, has really shown all of us in, in Boston throughout this country uh, the shortfalls that we have in, in our American economy right now. Um, one of the things that we did in the city of Boston pre pre previously to COVID was we saw that there was a pay equity gap uh, that was growing in the city of Boston. Uh, I work with the 200 largest employers in the city of Boston to give us data anonymously. Uh, that data allowed us, to, allowed us to look at the numbers to, to inform us what we already knew. Men were paid more than women, and when you look at break women down, white women were paid more than black women and Latino women, uh, and that we had an issue there. So we created a program which was called Salary Negotiation Workshops, where we helped over 20,000 women be able to negotiate their own salaries to increase their wages, uh, to be able to get more money into the economy, more money into their families, more money on the table, something that was really important for us. And during this pandemic, one of the things that you said in your opening statement and many of the meetings that I've had with senators is the need for childcare, uh, the need for getting women back into the economy. The, the last month, the, the large majority of the folks that have lost their job are women. Uh, many of those folks lost their job, quite honestly, because they didn't have adequate childcare. So we need to work to collectively as a federal government uh, to increase opportunities for women uh, and people of color. We need to close qual economic gaps. We need to close uh, racial gaps. Uh, and that's the work that I've been doing for the last seven years as mayor of the city of Boston. And I look forward to working with with people, uh, not just here in this committee, but the entire uh, administration, the Biden administration. The one thing that, that I find that was really interesting in all of my conversations with the senators, um, both Democrats and Republicans, um, each and every one of you spoke about the need for job training. Each and every one of you spoke about the need for preparing workers for the economy of the future. Uh, a big part of that economy of the future are women and people of color. So I find it will be one of my top priorities, uh, if, if confirmed, uh, when I get to the Department of Labor, 
is to work with each and every one of you to make sure that, that every American worker gets the opportunity to be successful. Okay, thank you. And the mission of the Department of Labor is to quote, foster, promote, and develop the welfare of the wage earners, job seekers, and retirees in the United States, improving working conditions, advance opportunities for profitable employment, and assure work-related benefits and rights, unquote. Unfortunately, the previous administration's Department of Labor did the opposite and too often put profits over people. And I really think it's time to have a Department of Labor that gets back to its job on behalf of our workers, creating enforceable health and safety standards to protect workers from COVID-19 during this pandemic, protecting workers from wage theft, particularly during this economic crisis, closing the wage gap and more. So Mayor Walsh, if you are confirmed as secretary, can workers rely upon you to make the Department of Labor a place that has their backs and enforces their rights to ensure that they are protected during this pandemic and beyond? The short answer is absolutely. And the second part of that is, uh, if I didn't feel that I could make a difference, um, and the president felt that I couldn't make a difference, I probably wouldn't be sitting here right now. Thank, thank you very much, Mayor. I will turn it over to Senator Burr for this round of questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Mayor, the Department of Labor's Office of Inspector found that between 2013 and 2016, OSHA did not establish or follow appropriate procedures for issuing guidance, and as a result, OSHA risk issuing guidance in violation of laws requiring public notice and comment. Uh, that could impact the efficiency and effectiveness of the programs to protect uh, the rights of workers. The OIG recommended that the department improve procedures and monitor compliance with procedures and train officials and staff as necessary. In response to these findings, OSHA agreed in 2019 to take the steps necessary to ensure guidance follows the proper procedures. Will you commit to adhere to these recommendations made by the OIG? Thank you, Ranking Member Burr. Um, that is an area that I want to work with you on. Uh, I find it very important when, when we talk about OSHA, and, and as I've been prepping uh, for this interview today or this hearing today, and as I've been talking to people, OSHA should not be an us versus them. OSHA is, an, is a part of an agency that should be there to protect workers on the job site. Uh, we have seen, and I have seen personally in the city of Boston, uh, many instances where unsafe conditions have led to um, serious injury to workers, in some cases throughout this country, death. And I find that rather than, rather than um, have discussions on what, what should OSHA be doing or not be doing, we should be working with OSHA and working with the administration and working with the members of this committee to talk about the importance of bringing OSHA back as an agency that is an agency that is there to help workers and help employers and not be uh, put in the middle of both. One of your priorities as mayor was to support free community college for graduates of Boston Public Schools. What role do community colleges play in the workforce system? Community colleges um, play, in my opinion, a very big role. Uh, and I think that not only uh, when we created that program in Boston in 2015, we were creating it off of a um, very prosperous um, building boom in the city of Boston. And we had additional revenue and we put money into making sure that we put young people in high schools on pathways to college or career. Uh, and one of those pathways to college was through community college. They couldn't afford to get into a big school, couldn't afford to pay it. And we created opportunity for young people to get into community college to put them on a pathway. I, f I feel that we have a real opportunity right now in the 21st century and at this point with COVID is not just to have college credits, but also create workforce opportunity, training opportunities. And I think that we need to do more with colleges, community colleges all across America to help, skill, help train the workforce for the future. Not every young person is cut out to go to college. You're looking at somebody that went to a year and a half of college after high school. I dropped out of college. I went into the trades. I was fortunate enough to get back into college and eventually graduate. But at the time, I was not, I did, I was not right for that. But creating opportunities through these pathways is really important. And I think community college can be a real asset to, to the American workforce. It can be real asset, quite honestly, to companies as well. When, as I said, when we created community colleges in the city of Boston, uh, businesses loved it because we, we're, we're partnering some of our community colleges with different, different industries so they can train their workforce as well. Does that mean you believe that community colleges should be free for every American? 
if we could do it, I think it would be great. I think uh, it's something that we should be, we should be planning for and, and trying to get to. Uh, I know that when we brought it into Boston, a lot of other, this, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts is looking at that now, trying to have free community college uh, through different pieces of legislation. Uh, I think if we can make community college free for, 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 for kids in our, in our systems, I think absolutely that, that's a goal we should be trying to do. If we federally mandated free college, what would that do to city budgets like uh, Boston and, and state budgets like Massachusetts. Well, I don't. I don't know if you're federally mandated. I think what you talk about is, is not everyone's cut out for community college either. And I think we have to put more more resources and, and revenue into job training programs. Not just what we do here in the federal government, but also throughout cities and states across the country as well with with employers. And I think that again, there's no there's no clear pathway for anyone. Everyone has a different path in life, uh, and not everyone's going to take advantage of a college or a community college. And that's why I think it's important for us to really focus on job training. programs programs and strengthening those job training programs to make sure that we have real outcomes so when you send somebody to a workforce training program or a community college that there's an outcome there. We have to make sure that we're setting these young people and people who go through them up for something success and that means a job, a job that gets them to the middle class. The 2019 report from the Government Accountability Office identified 43 federally supported employment and training programs across nine different agencies. This includes 19 programs at the Department of Labor. What do you believe is the role of the Department of Labor in coordinating training programs across the federal government? Well, after talking to a lot of the senators in the last couple of weeks, it's a lot. Um, there's been every, like I said, every single senator has brought up some sort of job training program uh, in their areas or in their territories they represent. Uh, so I look forward to one of the areas that, that I really have, have done a lot of work with in training is job training in the city of Boston. And we also added another component um, to financial empowerment where we help people understand how to build credit, how to pay their debt down. So, so there's a lot more, I know my time is up almost, there's a lot more to this conversation I'd love to have with you. It's something that obviously I'm passionate about, you can tell. And it really, it is an opportunity for us to really, when we think about the economy and the American worker, uh, if we truly want to get people into the middle class, we have to help them get into the middle class. And job training, community college, and many other programs that are out there are ways and pathways in. And that's what we have to continue to do is build those pathways into the middle class. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Thank you Senator. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Burr. Uh, we will turn to Senator Sanders. Thank you. Can we go, Chairman? Yes, well, yes, we can. Okay. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, welcome, and uh, congratulations on your excellent work in Boston. Um, let me begin by telling you what you already know, and that is that uh, tens of millions of workers in this country uh, are working at starvation wages. Uh, the gap between the very, very rich and everybody else is growing wider. Half of our people are living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you mentioned that in the city of Boston, uh, you have a $15 an hour minimum wage. I gather and understand that in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you're moving toward a $15 an hour minimum wage. Uh, how does that work for the people uh, in Boston and Massachusetts? And is that uh, a concept that you are sympathetic to? Uh, it's, it's working. Um, I think it's, it's helping people uh, be able to put a little more money in their pocket um, as a minimum wage. In the city of Boston, we actually have uh, something else called the living wage, which is higher than the minimum wage. And we work on, on city contracts to try and push that. Um, when, when I think about the minimum wage on a federal level, it's been 11 years since we've raised the minimum wage. Uh, the average family on a current minimum wage salary with the federal government is roughly $15,000 a year. Uh, it's impossible to raise a family of one on that, never mind a family of two, three, or four. So I definitely support raising the minimum wage. I know that President Biden uh, has made that part of his, his uh, economic plan as well. Good. Uh, you, uh, you're a union guy, and I think I have a lifetime 100% pro-union voting record. Uh, and I believe that if we're going to create a strong middle class in this country, uh, we need uh, to have a strong union movement. We need to make it uh, impossible for employers uh, to act illegally to prevent people from joining unions. Uh, can you tell us what you, as Secretary of Labor, will do to allow working people in this country to exercise their constitutional right uh, to join unions? Well, I know that, um, thank you, Senator, for that question. I know that uh, Chairwoman Murray mentioned today about the PRO Act that's going to be filed uh, with her and Leader Schumer. 
that is one step towards helping um, union uh, people to organize freely. Uh, I do believe in the right of organizing. I do believe in the right of uh, people being able to join a union if they choose to join, if they want to join a union. Um, so I certainly support that. Okay. In, in the midst of so many of our people struggling economically, it is no great secret, as Senator Murray mentioned, that women and people of color are often struggling even harder. Uh, do you have some specific ideas as to how we can make real progress in combating systemic racism and sexism and make sure that all of our people, uh, regardless of their gender or the color of their skin, are able to advance economically? No, absolutely. I, I think first and foremost, we have to have more conversations around the country. I don't think there's enough conversations going on. I know that in the beginning of uh, the COVID crisis in Boston, one of the things that we, we saw in healthcare was that people of color, particularly the black community, was, was, was testing at a higher rate of positivity cases in COVID-19. Uh, we put together a health inequities task force. Uh, that health inequities task force led to having conversations around hospitalization and the ability for lack of access to hospitalization and care. Uh, that task force stayed, is still in existence today and still moving forward. Uh, we're working now uh, through across departments, uh, whether it's our Office of Equity, our Office of Economic Development, the, the Boston Planning and Development Agency, about creating opportunities, whether it's, in, uh, whether it's in private development or it's in public development. Uh, it's, about, it's about creating opportunities, and we have to close those gaps. Uh, our country, and I'll speak for Boston, our country, but Boston, uh, we're dealing with a system of systemic racism uh, that we have to continue to address. It's not simply just being throwing fancy words out there but in policies, but it's actually doing the work, rolling up our sleeves. And uh, in our city, we have worked with different organizations, and we have a women's task force groups. We have all kinds of different organizations working with the NAACP, uh, working with the Urban League, working with employers. Uh, I've seen it happen in Boston where we all get to the table and there really is very little disagreement at the table. The issue is how do we move agendas forward? And, and as I mentioned in my opening statement, I am a proud collaborator and, and I don't like top down pushing on something. I would rather have a conversation about having everyone understand the importance of the issue, whether that's pay equity, whether that's discrimination, whether that's workplace violence. How do we, how do we address those issues? So I look forward to working uh, with you, Senator, and the entire Senate, quite honestly, and Congress, but members of this committee and how we can advance some of, some of the concerns that I'm going to hear today. Well, Mr. Mayor, uh, thank you very much, and I look forward to working with you as well. Take care. Thank you very much, Senator Sanders. We will go to Senator Marshall. All right. Um, Madam Chair, again, thanks for having me. Ranking Member Burr, it's good to be back here again, and, and Mayor, welcome. I want to talk about minimum wage for just a, just a second. Um, you're Boston, Massachusetts, what, what's the last cup of coffee you paid for? What did it cost? Last cup of coffee I paid for in Boston was probably at Doughboy Donuts, and I think it was $1.75. Well, that's, that's a good deal. That's a good bargain. You believe in, in Kansas, where I live, uh, some of the gas stations will give you a cup of coffee if you fill your truck up with gas and, you know, certainly commonly getting it less, for, less than a dollar. As I look at uh, cost of living, median house in Boston, $600,000. The median house in my hometown of Great Bend is $83,000. The cost of living index in Boston is literally 2.2, a multiple of 2.2 from where I live. You have a minimum wage right now of, of $12? Yeah, it's 12.78, baby. 12, $12, the minimum wage in Great Bend is 7.25. So a $7 an hour job in Great Bend would be like a $16 an hour job in Boston, Massachusetts. I, I guess, you know, I'm trying to get at is how can we have a nationwide minimum wage of $15, which, which frankly would kill a lot of jobs in, in Kansas. So how, I mean, I'm all for if you want $15 an hour in Boston, knock your socks off. But uh, in Kansas, that would be a, a pretty big wage, a job killing wage. Well, thank you, Senator. I think the, the issue around minimum wage is actually going to be debated on the Senate floor and the United States Congress floor. Uh, President Biden has, has stressed that he is supportive of a $15 an hour minimum wage, uh, a nation wage, national, national wage. Uh, I support him in that $15 an hour minimum wage, and I think that there's going to be many conversations from now till uh, something passes the Senate and the House 
uh, around conversations about how that, if, if in fact it passes, how does that $15 an hour minimum wage get imp instituted, implemented? Okay, thank you for that answer. I want to talk about uh, police for a second. My father was a police officer for almost 30 years, and it's uh, certainly an issue close to my heart. And it's my understanding that you reallocated $12 million from the Boston Police Department's overtime budget to you know, basically defund the police. I'm very happy that President Biden during this campaign stated he was opposed to efforts to defund the police. And of course, I'm very sensitive and, and uh, proud of my police officers, including those in many of the unions across the country. As a supporter of unions, how do you reconcile your actions to defund the department with your responsibility to protect officers and keep them safe? Yeah, thank you. I love my Boston Police Department. Uh, and if you had a chance to talk to any of the members of my police department, they will tell you uh, the support that I've shown them uh, all along as my time as mayor and prior to that being mayor. Uh, that was not a defund movement. What we did there was we moved, shifted $12 million uh, from the police budget uh, into, into um, programs such as mental health counseling, uh, trauma counseling, uh, to deal with the issues that we're dealing with in the city of Boston. Uh, my Boston Police Department officers have not lost one hour of overtime uh, from the beginning of this budget cycle. Okay. And let's talk just a second about right to work. Kansas has is, is, uh, been a right to work state since, since the constitutional amendment in 1975, and the President's administration's proposed eliminating right to work laws in all 28 states that had them, some going back to decades. Do you believe it brings the country together to upend state constitutions, and do you believe that individual workers should have the right to decide whether they belong to a union? Uh, yes, I, I believe, I think that we need to continue to strengthen the American worker here. Um, my, my role, if confirmed as Secretary of Labor, uh, would be to work to, to strengthen the American worker. I think the worker has every right to choose what they believe, uh, and I always have believed that. I think that, um, you know, people have different opinions of unions and different opinions of business and different opinions of corporation. And I see my role, quite honestly, as a Secretary of Labor, is bringing different ideas and different thought processes together and trying to come up with some common understandings and support. All right. Thank you, Mayor. I yield back. Thanks, Senator. Good luck on Sunday. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Senator Marshall. We will turn to Senator Casey. Thank you, Madam Chair. I really appreciate the opportunity to be with uh, Mayor Walsh. I'm grateful for your nomination, and I want to commend and salute your public service uh, to the city of Boston, uh, your work in the, uh, as a state representative, and your work as a, as a union official. And we're grateful you're willing to do more public service for the nation as Secretary of Labor. And um, I'm grateful for the, your willingness to uh, take on some tough issues. I wanted to try to get to maybe two or three issues. The first one I'll start with is um, an issue that relates to people with disabilities and employment. We know that in order to rebuild the economy and help millions of unemployed Americans return to not just employment, but safe employment, it's critical that we make sure that workers with disabilities aren't left behind. Despite the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, now 30 years ago, we've made, uh, and, and also advances we've made in assistive technology, job coaching, and other supports, good employment opportunities for people with disabilities remain far too limited. In 2020, only about 34 percent of people with disabilities between the ages of 16 and 64 were in the labor force compared to about 76 percent of people without disabilities. So 34 percent versus 76. We can do a hell of a lot better than that. So I'm concerned that as our economy recovers from the pandemic, people with disabilities will have a particularly difficult time finding uh, work and re or returning to work as they did in the aftermath of the Great Recession. So, Mayor Walsh, what are some of the steps you believe the Department of Labor can take to ensure that people with disabilities are not left behind by the recovery and um, steps you can take to promote competitive, integrated employment opportunities? Thank you very much, uh, Senator Casey, and I, I enjoyed our conversation the other day, and I look forward to um, talking to you more about uh, a whole host of issues. I know 
The issue of disability is also very important to Senator Hassan. Uh, we've sent, we've spent some time talking about that. I know that there is an office of the, the office of disability and employment policy at DOL. Uh, it's a small but mighty office, and, and I look forward to working to strengthen that office, as well as within my own office now, currently as mayor of the city, uh, my office of uh, disabilities, uh, which we've been, I've been very engaged with, um, to really create opportunities for people, uh, not just job opportunities, but other opportunities that that we need. Um, we have a great program in Boston. It's called Work Incorporated. And Work Inc. Uh, is in Dorchester, uh, and it's a job placement training program uh, for people with disabilities. And one of the ways that I think that we can strengthen uh, the opportunity for people is to get organizations like Work Inc. and give them the supports and the supports that they need, whether it's through workforce development grants and training, uh, but also continue to expand those opportunities. We also have to sit down, in my opinion, with employers to create opportunities for, for folks with disabilities at different, uh, op different job sites and opportunities. Uh, we've been able to do that in the city of Boston, and I think that we can take that model nationwide. I know that in your home state you've done it, up in New Hampshire we've done it, uh, in different places. So uh, this is an area, one of the areas that, that I would like to spend a lot of time and attention on. Uh, creating real pathways for folks with disabilities. People with disabilities should not be treated as second-class citizens. People with disabilities should not be treated as if they're invisible. People with disabilities are human beings. They're our brothers and sisters, and we need to treat them with the respect that they deserve. Mayor, thanks very much. I wanted to talk finally about uh, minor safety. In your opening remarks, you noted that one of the most important jobs in the department is keeping workers safe on the job. The men and women working in America's mines rely upon MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, to enforce safety laws and regulations to keep them safe. Uh, we need an MSHA that's going to keep those workers safe and also an MSHA to, that will strengthen the silica exposure standard to, to better protect those miners. My grandfather on my father's side, Alphonsus Liguori Casey, uh, worked in the mines as a kid from 1905 to 1910, uh, later went on to become a lawyer in his early 30s. But like a lot of kids in northeastern Pennsylvania, uh, he was not given the protections as a, as a child, nor were the adults working in the mines. We need to make sure EMSHA is enforcing the, the rules, and I just want to get your thoughts on that as we wrap up. No, I, I mean, I agree with you 100% uh, on, on the safety. Um, we don't have as I said to you on the phone the other day, we don't have any mines in the city of Boston, but what we have done is we've built tunnels, uh, and we have a lot of dangerous work in the city of Boston, and we need to make sure that when, when our workers, whether they go into a mine, a tunnel, or on a construction site, or wherever they go, that they have all the protections that, that they need and deserve, and, and I certainly look forward to working with you uh, more, a lot closer uh, when it comes to mine safety. Mayor, thanks. We look forward to your confirmation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Casey. Senator Collins. Thank you very much. Welcome, Mayor. It's great to have a fellow New Englander uh, nominated for this important post. I want to bring up an issue that affected us in the state of Maine, which is that we experienced widespread unemployment compensation fraud last spring as we were plussing up uh, the payments for people who through no fault of their own were unemployed as a result of the pandemic. And what we saw were these criminal enterprises ruthlessly exploiting gaps in systems and states all over the country. At the height of the pandemic, the state of Maine had to cancel more than 100,000 initial claims and weekly certifications that were determined to be fraudulent. And this obviously slows the system for Mainers who legitimately need the additional unemployment compensation to get by. Do you support federal funding to help states upgrade their systems? Because part of the problems is we have these legacy systems uh, that simply cannot handle increased volumes that are slow to adjust for changing results and that cannot easily catch fraud. Thank you, Senator Collins, and thank you for your uh, 
our conversation the other day, I look forward to visiting your home state. Um, not only do I support the federal government helping, uh, it's, a, it's a necessary step. Uh, unemployment insurance, uh, first of all, the, the money that goes to un, um, unemployed workers is taxpayers' dollars. So we need to make sure that every single dollar uh, gets, to the, gets to an unemployed worker uh, because we're helping them. Uh, we have never seen a time in our history, country's history like we're experiencing right now with the, the mass loss of jobs from the beginning of COVID in probably, I'd say, mid-March through last week. Uh, the unemployment system needs to be brought into the 21st century as far as technology. I know that in my own home state of Massachusetts, uh, we had you know, hundreds of thousands of workers unemployed overnight. Uh, the city of Boston worked with the state, with the, my governor, Governor Baker, to help them be able to process some claims. We were able to assist and train up some folks. But it's, it's about technology. We're in the 21st century, and some of the systems that our, our states are working on is antiquated. We need to change the system, not only change it in the sense of bringing, bringing the systems up, but we also have to make it easier for workers that are unemployed to access unemployment benefits and easier for workers that are unemployed when they go back to work to be able to let, let the states know that they're back to work. So I absolutely would look forward to working with you in this committee, but the entire Congress to talk about how do we make those investments, as well as Ranking Member Burr mentioned in his opening statement about the need of, of commerce and labor at one point working together. I commit to this committee today I commit to the President of the United States of America today that commerce and labor will work together. We'll work hand in hand with each other as we move forward. One of the issues will be unemployment insurance, and there are many other issues that we're going to have. But I promise you, we are going to work together for the American worker and for the American economy. Thank you. And one of those issues that we discussed is the importance of the H-2B program uh, to the state of Maine. It helps to preserve Maine jobs because during our tourism season in an ordinary year, we will have four times the population of the entire state uh, come to the great state of Maine. And our tourism industry is extremely seasonal. So it's not that the businesses aren't trying to find Maine workers. They're simply not enough. We had a great deal of difficulty in working with the previous administration on this issue, and I suspect it's an issue in the state of Alaska as well, and perhaps North Carolina too. And I just want to ask for a commitment from you uh, to work with us to ensure that the H-2B program has sufficient returning workers, foreign workers, to meet the needs of our seasonal businesses. No, thank you, Senator. And, and you know, that's an issue that we spoke about and Senator McCuskey as well, when, when I spoke to her. Um, I absolutely, you have my commitment to work with you on this issue. Um, it, it'll certainly bring smiles to the faces of people in Massachusetts, just down uh, 93 a little bit, down Route 3 to Cape Cod. So I think they'd be happy as well. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Collins. And we will turn to Senator Bolt. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Walsh, for joining us today and for your willingness to continue that service by leading the Department of Labor. I am looking forward to your swift confirmation and working with you to help address the many challenges facing our nation's workers, families, and businesses. So, um, as we know, millions of essential healthcare workers food service workers, grocery store workers, and others have been on the front lines of this pandemic since it began. Um, and it's about time, I think, that Washington steps up to put those workers' health and safety first. Do you believe protecting worker health is central to protecting public health in general and combating the spread of this pandemic? And if so, how do you plan to lead the Department of Labor in this effort? Thank you, Senator. Let me just, uh, while I have this microphone for a moment, um, on a nationwide level, thank all of our grocery store workers, um, our first responders, our ambulance drivers, our nurses, our custodians, uh, the people that are on the front line. In the city of Boston, when the pandemic hit us the hardest, those are the folks 
that want to work every single day. In the very beginning, if you remember, very little PPE. We were all going after it, fighting each other to try and get PPE in our states and our cities. Uh, and these folks went to work every single day and kept our economy, our economy moving forward. The Department of Labor, Secretary of Labor, if I don't protect those workers and we don't protect those workers, then I don't have a right to be sitting in that seat. And those are, are my people. Those are the people that uh, through snowstorms, through tragedies, through a pandemic, they're constantly there for us day in and day out. And we need to do everything we can uh, to support those workers uh, because they support us on a, on a daily basis. So I look forward to, to continuing the conversation with you, Senator, uh, but also really you know, doing some legislative stuff to support workers. But we don't need the legislation to support workers that, 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 that take care of us every day. And again, I want to just personally thank all of those first responders, thank those grocery store workers and all those folks who you've been working tirelessly uh, that if confirmed, you'll have a Secretary of Labor that understands and cares and loves you and loves the work that you do every single day. Well, I appreciate that. Um, I have been calling on OSHA to implement an emergency temporary standard for months. And this is really long overdue. So I would urge you to make a swift decision and move forward on an enforceable safety standard immediately if that hasn't already begun to happen by the time you're confirmed. I, I want to sort of add on to uh, the call for OSHA to issue an enforceable standard. Um, included in the Biden administration's January 21st executive order on protecting worker health and safety, uh, President Biden asked Congress to pass legislation that strengthens and expands OSHA's authority um, as provisions in my COVID-19 Every Worker Protection Act of 2021 would do. Um, we uh, think that uh, OSHA's emergency temporary uh, standard, if and when issued, um, is exceedingly important, but it still won't reach all workers, which is why we do have to act legislatively. Why do you think these expanded safety protections are needed, and how will workers be left unprotected if Congress fails to act? Yeah, I, I, first and foremost, I also, so just a side note for a second, uh, President Biden also wants to increase the number of inspectors at OSHA. Uh, it's down about 500 over the last four years. And so if we increase standards and don't increase inspectors, then we really don't protect the American worker. Uh, I find it really important that uh, as we think about these standards, again, as I said in, my, in, in the earlier part of the, the conversation here, uh, OSHA should not be looked at by business and saying, oh my God, this is terrible, let's not do that. This is about protecting their workforce, it's about protecting their companies, it's about protecting their products. And I, I do think that I look forward to working with the Biden administration. I look forward to working with the Department of Labor uh, on, on, on a closer uh, basis uh, when confirmed to uh, make sure that OSHA is one of the first top priorities that I will uh, address and tackle uh, once confir if confirmed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Baldwin. Senator Cassidy. Hey, Mayor Walsh, uh, thank you for being here. I enjoyed our conversation. Um, and as you know, I, as I told you, I have a brother who lives in Randolph, so it's kind of nice to have a connection with a beloved brother. Um, Senator Burr uh, spoke to this. I'd like to return to it. Quoting Jimmy Hoffa uh, regarding the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline, the, the Teamsters strongly oppose. This executive order doesn't just affect U.S. Teamsters. It hurts our Canadian brothers and sisters as well. It reduces good-paying union jobs that allow workers to provide a middle-class standard of living to their families. Um, now, I'm trying to represent that perspective. And one picture I love was the one or I loved. It was just so poignant. Uh, I don't know if love's the right word. In USA Today, uh, the guy in Arkansas standing in front of a partially completed home 
he had been told to lay off 11 of his workers and kind of the story was, how was he going to pay for his home? Do you agree or disagree with Mr. Hoffa as regards the impact of that executive order? Senator, thank you for your conversation. It was great to talk to you the other day, and, and I look forward to uh, continuing. Maybe actually when you come to Massachusetts, oh, well, I'm going to be down here, so we can, we'll take you to dinner in Boston. At some point, we'll go back. Um, I'm a laborer. Uh, I'm a member of Labor's Local 223, International Union, Layuna. Um, when that executive order was, was signed by President Biden, uh, many of the workers on that, on that job site were labor mem union members, laborers, the same union book in my pocket that they have. But also in the American Recoveries Plan, there is there's an opportunity that we have to build back better by creating hundreds of thousands of green jobs. So, 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 so Mayor, if I can, because my time's limited, will those jobs be available tomorrow? They, again, if the quicker we can get the American Recovery Plan but, passed. But, but my point being, because I think you're talking past me, because the Keystone XL jobs are gone today actually last week. The jobs you're describing are in the by and by, hopefully within a year, more likely longer than that. Mr. Hoffa also said, aside from 8,000 union workers losing their work, this impacted their ability to pay into their pension and their retirement. Is that a correct statement by Mr. Hoffa? Yeah, well, Mr. Hoffa, if, you're not, if you don't work in that industry, you do not get pension credit. You do not get health care credit. That's absolutely. So the executive order, and I grant that the administration has high hopes that sometime from now, maybe even six months, probably more like one or two or three or four years, there will be jobs which will replace these on the ledger sheet because the pipe fitter may not get a job at making solar panels because that's a different set of training. The pipe fitter may be 55, et cetera. The impact on that pipe fitter the guy in front of that half-completed house, will that be made up tomorrow by everything the administration is planning in their American Recovery Act? The jobs that were lost during Keystone will be more than made up with the American Recovery Act. For that individual worker? That pipe fitter will be connecting steam. That pipe fitter will have opportunities in that economy. Uh, that iron worker will have opportunities in that economy. That laborer, that operator, that teamster, that carpenter, that plumber, uh, all of those different trades um, and skills that, that people have in this country uh, will, would have, will have un great opportunity in this new economy as we move forward. And is there a sense of when the first of those jobs would come out knowing that the money's not even been appropriated yet and it's got to filter its way through the system and there has to be bids made? And there has to be go on. Um, I think it's reasonable to say it'll be quite some time. But the guy's got a mortgage payment next month. And um, now I will just make parenthetically, don't ask you to comment on this. We had experts yesterday in the Energy Committee, bipartisan experts. And what they said is that we are going to continue to use oil and gas uh, for decades around the world. The United States uses the best, the highest environmental standards. If we don't produce it, another country will, which does not have our standards, which will increase global greenhouse gas emissions. Not only do we lose the jobs, they migrate to another country, maybe making Russia's economy better, for example, uh, but we increase global greenhouse gas emissions. I applaud the efforts to employ those tradesmen and women on other types of activity, but we are being disingenuous if we don't recognize the impact it has upon them right now. They face poverty because of an executive order that will, do, that will increase global greenhouse gas emissions. With that, Mayor, I uh, yield back, and I thank you for your testimony, uh, and I thank you for offering yourself for service. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Cassidy. We will go to Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, great to see you, uh, Mayor. Thank you very much for uh, the time this week uh, and our conversation. I enjoyed it. Um, I wanted to try to uh, squeeze in uh, two or three topics, if I can, in my short amount of time here. Um, the first is the issue of uh, mental health. Um, the CDC reported that during the pandemic, 
uh, there has been a really substantial increase in emergency room visits for mental health and substance abuse, 24% um, for 5 to 11-year-olds, uh, for 12 to 17-year-olds, 31%. This is particularly acute amongst children uh, who are experiencing lots of traumas because of the COVID epidemic. Um, might seem like a strange topic to raise with the potential uh, Secretary of Labor, except for the fact that Labor actually um, holds the enforcement powers with respect to mental health parity laws. Uh, Senator Cassidy and I actually passed legislation at the end of last year um, that gives the Department of Labor new powers to do audits of insurance companies to make sure that they are complying with the parity law. Often what we find is that insurance companies put up all sorts of bureaucratic hurdles to reimbursement for mental health and substance abuse treatment that you don't find if you're going for an orthopedic visit uh, or for a cancer treatment. Um, and so I, I just want to ask uh, you to make a commitment that you're going to um, implement these new um, authorities and that you'll work with us to make sure that the Department of Labor is an active participant in making sure that the parity laws that have been supported by Republicans and Democrats um, are working. Thank you, Senator. And, um one of the, um, when I was mentioned as a potential um, nominee for this job, I went, um, I went online and I was reading all the different areas of the Department of Labor. I, I knew obviously a lot of the, the kind of the bread and butter of, of the Department of Labor. And when I got to the section that talked about mental health and substance use, uh, it perked my attention um, for my personal story but also for my time in the legislature or as mayor or whatever it was, there isn't a member in this room today, not a person in this room today, that a family member or a close friend or one person removed are dealing with the issue of mental health issue, parent, mental health problems, or substance use problems, whether that's drugs or alcohol. Um, and it's something that, quite honestly, we need to do a lot more for. Yes, COVID has put a big spotlight on it, and we can see that mental health um, crises are more and more every day, and they're going into people are going more and go, using hospital and accessing treatment, and substance use disorder. Obviously, it's no surprise the the the, the disease of substance use is a disease, disease of isolation, and we're in a period where we're telling people not to congregate and don't see each other. So I will do everything I can, and that's if I don't really personally don't mind if it bothers people. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure we have parity for mental health and substance use disorder and that people have access to treatment because, because that, that is a game changer for people. That is a game changer for families to have that type of treatment accessible and available and not have to go through all kinds of loops because when somebody, you have a moment in time, when somebody has a mental health issue and they're willing to get help or somebody has a substance use disorder issue, they're willing to get help, you have a moment. You have a moment to make that happen. And you can't wait till next Tuesday or next Thursday or next week or next month because that opportunity is going to be gone. And there's op chances there that you lose that person. So my answer to you, my long answer to you, my short answer to you, yes, I, do, I will work with you. Uh, great. And again, you'll, you'll see that you have new authorities granted you by Congress uh, that you can use, and uh, I hope that, that you'll be vigorous and uh, in using them. Um, let me ask one more question, and that is um, about uh, the work that the Department of Labor has done uh, to help us build up um, our workforce capacity in the defense industrial um, uh, area. In Connecticut, we're really proud of something we call the Eastern Connecticut Manufacturing Pipeline Initiative. It's gained national recognition because um, it partners together uh, Electric Boat, which makes our submarines in Eastern Connecticut, with our community colleges and our workforce training programs uh, in order to make sure that we're supplying Electric Boat, in this case, and their supply chain with the tens of thousands of workers that they're going to need as we dramatically scale up uh, submarine production. Um, this was made possible by a grant from the Department of Labor, but the Trump administration ceased making these kind of grants to public-private partnerships. Um, can you? I know you've had experience in this area. Um, I just wanted your commitment to take a look at that program uh, and um, talk to us on both sides of the aisle about potentially restarting it. It's really important to us in Connecticut. Yeah, absolutely, Senator. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair.
Thank you very much. We will turn to Senator Murkowski. Thank you, Madam Chairman and Mayor. It was good to talk with you the other day. Look forward to, uh, to your visit to Alaska. You had expressed a great deal of enthusiasm about that, and we want to make sure that we, uh, we uh, show you the best. We've got some interesting jobs up north, as I mentioned to you. We, we have resources. We have oil, we have gas, we have minerals, we have trees, we have fish. Um, what we don't have is manufacturing. We don't manufacture automobiles, we don't, we don't produce pharmaceuticals. And so as, as we look to uh, this, this transition, um, uh, the incoming administration, the Biden administration has said we're, we're going to be moving, making this transition to these clean energy jobs. And uh, we're very proud of the way that we do uh, produce our, our resources and, and try to do them uh, with a limited environmental footprint, uh, working as much as possible uh, to, to make sure that we have reduced our emissions and that we are, we are accessing these resources in a responsible way. But at the end of the day, whether you're the, the automobile manufacturer or the pharmaceutical or the, or the, the, the uh, company that's manufacturing the wind turbines here in America, we want all of that. We got to get the resources from somewhere. And this is where states like Alaska have that, that advantage because we have that natural bounty and we are willing to, to be the producers so that we can provide for the rest of the country. And so to follow on Senator Kennedy's, uh, excuse me, Cassidy's comments about the impact of the Keystone Pipeline and the decision made there and real jobs, real energy jobs lost now, I, I would ask that you look critically um, when you talk about the, the energy jobs that are lost, that we're also thinking about our, our, our critical minerals, the, the base resource that allows us to, again, have, have uh, an opportunity here in this country to, to be somewhat independent. In the, in the Energy Committee that Senator Cassidy uh, referenced yesterday, one of the other statements that was made was that we, for a period of time, were, were energy vulnerable. We were importing our oil. We, we turned that corner. We are an exporter. But we are now showing greater vulnerability when it comes to our mineral resources. And the analogy that was made was we've gone from vulnerability from a, from a liquid state to now a solid state, if you will. I raise this because when we think about those, those jobs around the country and how we transition to clean jobs, I think we need to remember that there will be certain parts of the country where you will, where you will need to continue to access these base resources. So what we want to be able to do is do that in a way that harnesses the, the, the strong technologies that allow us to do, uh, to do this with reduced emissions. But don't kill the jobs. Don't send those jobs overseas where the environmental practices are much less uh, responsible, where the, where the labor practices are clearly less responsible. Um, there's not really a question there, Mayor, but I wanted to just reinforce what, what Senator Cassidy has raised, uh, because I think this is the re one of the responsibilities that you will have if confirmed as secretary, which I assume you will be, is ensuring that jobs across America continue and that they're good jobs that can sustain uh, families and, and, and even in high-cost states like Alaska. In our conversation, I also mentioned fish and the, the significance of that to our state's economy. I want to, to just reinforce what Senator Collins mentioned with the H-2Bs, uh, recognizing that we're going to need your help with, with ensuring that the systems are fair, that there is the ability to, uh, to count on, on these workers. So if we need legislation to change the programs, uh, we want to work with you to do just exactly that. I, I, do, I do ask, though, that uh, in addition to, to looking longer term for, for the changes that will need to come, that you will help us with this upcoming season in ensuring that we have uh, the ability to bring in these, these workers. Again, these are in areas that are as remote as you will ever find. <coughs> there, <coughs> there's not a lot of 
uh, a lot of entertainment after work. It's pretty, it's a, it's a pretty challenging um, environment. So we want to get you up to the state so that you can see firsthand these good resource jobs and jobs that, uh, that Alaskans have come to, to rely on and the country has come to rely on what we produce. Madam Chairman, I'm sorry there wasn't a question there, um, but I think the mayor and I have had a good chance to talk, and this was my five minutes to just put it on the record with you. I look forward to co-hosting you. Thank you, Senator. I look forward to visiting your state. Very good. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Senator Murkowski. We will turn to Senator Kane. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Mayor, welcome. I've got a soft spot for Irish Catholic mayors who grew up in pro-union households. Um, <laughs> and I'm very, very happy to have you. And, and just. I'll say, I'm so glad that uh, President Biden has asked somebody with a labor background to be in the cabinet. Um, I, when I was governor, put a labor guy in as a cabinet secretary, and my legislature blocked him. It's the first time that a legislature had ever blocked any cabinet nominee. I was able to then put him in charge of the state's workforce programs, which wasn't confirmable by my legislature. But they seemed very worried that somebody from labor would be sitting around the table. We've had so many people in my state and in this country who had great business experience or secretaries of commerce or heads of the Small Business Administration, and that's exactly as it should be, but we don't have a full picture, a full spectrum of views around the table if we don't have labor represented right there at the cabinet table, and so I'm very, very happy that the president has nominated you. Um, Senator Baldwin talked about the idea of the OSHA temporary standard, and I don't want to belabor it, but I am proud that Virginia was the first state to adopt one. Uh, we adopted it in a special session last year, and I think it's working well by all accounts. It was very responsive to the needs of people who were really, really worried about what, you know, whether they could safely go to work or not at the early stages of this pandemic where there was a lot of information and also misinformation about what safety was and wasn't and giving clear guidance to employers and clear guidance to workers and clear guidance to customers has been a positive. And so should you be confirmed, I hope you'll take a look at the standard that Virginia and now other states have followed, have done as potential guidance for what OSHA might do. You're a laborer. Um, my dad ran a shop that was iron worker organized. We need a lot of workers who are trained in these fields. Um, I think it's likely my view that President Biden might do an infrastructure bill, but you can't do big infrastructure investments if you don't have the people who are there to do the job. Surveys of our workforce suggest that um, workers in infrastructure industries are expected to retire at a, about a 50 percent higher rate than the general workforce because of age and the challenges of the, uh, of the job. Um, I hope that you will work with me and with Secretary Cardona, who was before us yesterday and did a good job at his hearing because I think these are kind of cross-cutting issues. I hope you'll work with the committee, and I know you've talked with the chairman about this on the community college side, to really focus on ways that we can build the workforce that we'll be needing if we're gonna make a commitment to broadband to everybody or make a commitment to the green energy economy. Um, as we work towards passing infrastructure, um, just talk a little bit about what you see DOL's role and your role as secretary in making sure that we're preparing folks to do those important jobs? Yeah, first and foremost, and thank you. Uh, I, I was looking, doing some research, and uh, saw what your state did uh, at the beginning of the pandemic um, and saved lives, quite honestly, the work that was there to save lives. Uh, I think that the work of the DOL, um, quite honestly, can do the same in many different areas. We can save lives when it comes to standards uh, and, and working with OSHA. Uh, we can enhance opportunities when it comes to green jobs and technology. Uh, we can work with, uh, we can enhance opportunities and, and deal with pay equity uh, when it comes to, with, to women and people of color. Um, there's lots of areas we can, we can expand mental health and substance use treatment. Uh, there's lots of areas within the Department of Labor uh, that is, is, we talk about it being pro-worker, but it's pro-economy. And, and, you know, I was thinking about it last night as I was preparing for today, uh, thinking about my, my role as the Secretary of Labor. And it went back to home base for me. I thought about my uncle and my father talking at the kitchen table on Sundays about fighting for the rights of workers, about making sure the jobs were there so people wouldn't be unemployed, making sure that they didn't have to have benefit dances to support union brothers and sisters because their kids were sick or somebody died. 
uh, I thought about the employers that I work with as the mayor of the city of Boston that, that want to build things and want to grow, want to attract you know, tech companies and sneaker companies and financial service companies to the city of Boston. Uh, that's, not a competing, that's not competing with the American worker. That's enhancing the American worker. And you know, what you see is what you get. And there's an opportunity for us to really, you know, I keep, keep hearing stories about you know, the past administration and, and what they didn't do and the one before that, what they didn't do, what they didn't do. We have an opportunity right now. I can't, I can't do anything about the past. All I can talk about is the future. All I can talk about is that if confirmed, you and the American people are going to get 100% out of me each and every day. And the American people are made up of workers, of businesses, of industry. Um, so I know I'm a little off what, what you asked me, but, but to bring it back home is, yes, I'm going to do everything I can as the head of the Department of Labor, if confirmed, to be able to advance workers' rights and to move our economy forward. When I say advance workers' rights, if it means being safe on the job site, it means being safe on the job site. Somebody had to come into this room today and set it up. And somebody had to come into this room yesterday after the hearing and clean it down. So we need to make sure we continue to, 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 to make sure that we advance. If we advance the American worker, we're advancing the American economy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Mad Thank thanks, you, Madam Senator. Chair. Thanks, Madam <laughs> Chair. I know who you meant. Thank you, Senator Kane. Uh, we will turn to Senator Braun. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, first of all, really enjoyed our conversation a, a week ago. I think it maybe exceeded a half an hour, and there was so much we were talking about. I come from the world of small business. Was lucky over time that my 15-employee uh, enterprise ended up turning into a national company. Three of my four kids, a great young executive team, run it. I'd like to talk about where we were pre-COVID. Uh, to me, it was the hottest economy that I've ever been a part of. The policies that were different from the prior administration, to me, I think, had a lot to do with it. And I'll cite a few of them. Uh, we had finally started to move wages. And I've been a proponent because I treat my employees like family. Raising wages is as important as your return on equity. Uh, it's part of what almost all small businesses would have as the highest priority. Were we making progress, and I'll cite that it was happening through the private sector and the marketplace, uh, what was wrong with that, and uh, why do we want to fix something uh, if it's not broken? Uh, thank you, Senator, I enjoyed our conversation as well, and I look forward to having many more with you. And, and um, you know, um, your, your story of, of starting a small business um, is the American dream in a lot of ways. Uh, we have many small businesses in Boston. Uh, some of those small businesses turn into big corporations, which is God bless them, and that's a good thing to see. Um, I think that the economy, I, I, mean, I mean, talking to my colleagues, U.S. Conference of Mayors and Mayors around the country, we were doing really well in urban areas and not necessarily in, in rural areas of the country uh, over the last four, five, 10, 15 years. And I do think that there's an opportunity to continue to build back an economy. Um, COVID, COVID just stopped everything in its tracks. We know that. I mean, I saw what it's done in the city of Boston to restaurants, small businesses, to, to, to the workforce, to everything. If, if we didn't have COVID, we wouldn't be talking about unemployment insurance. We wouldn't be talking about fraud. We wouldn't be talking about you know, the, the American Rescue Plan. We wouldn't be talking about all that stuff. We'd be talking about how do we move our economy forward. Uh, we need to get back to that point. We need to get back, but we also need to think back. You know, President Biden talks about building back better. He's talking about that for all Americans across the board. So I agree with you. Raising wages is important, and thank you for, t for, for mentioning that. But I, I also thinking that we have to start making sure that it's every single city and town in the United States of America that benefits from a good economy, not just places like Boston, Massachusetts, or you know, Dallas, Texas, or Chicago, or wherever. I agree with that as well, because uh, it's different across the country. Uh, Places that have uh, higher costs of living generally have higher wages. Places like Indiana, where I think it's a sweet spot in the United States with high incomes and low costs of living, uh, want to segue into this, and it's the minimum wage. Uh, almost any small business, mine included, proud that we have one of the highest starting wages in the lowest unemployment county, or one of them in Indiana, uh, do to that extent because they want to keep their employees. They want them to have uh, a good living out of the business that the employees and the owners of small business are more interactive, you know, than any other 
place in the economy, especially big corporations and their employees. So tipped wage income it, among restaurants that have been most devastated, and I would differ a little bit that when you start getting bureaucratic about essential workers and not in my downtown, every small business was shut down, and they could have practiced the uh, distancing and wearing masks better than some of the places that were considered essential. Putting that aside, focusing on minimum wage, speaking to our restaurant association and an owner telling me how his uh, tipped wage employees were making between 15 and 25 bucks an hour. Uh, by taking that away to the uh, sector most devastated, you'd then be putting them into almost a different paradigm if you push forward with a comprehensive minimum wage of 15 bucks. Uh, in this case, I think you need to look at it to where you reflect the differences between places and that you don't have a one-size-fits-all, which maybe was the way we went wrong with handling the pandemic in the first place. We needed to treat it with respect, but should have been maybe a little more careful on what we did bureaucratically. Tell me what you would do on that particular part with restaurants most devastated, taking away their tipped wage plan that actually exceeds the minimum wage in almost all places. Thank you. So two things. One is I think President Biden's been very clear on the minimum wage as a whole. He would like to have bipartisan support to move a piece of legislation forward to support increasing the minimum wage. So he's been clear on that and it's been reported in, in, on, in the news for the last several days. On the second part of your question, ironically yesterday I was talking to uh, a restaurant owner in Boston who owns restaurants around the country uh, and this issue came up. Uh, and, and we talked about we talked about this particular issue because he's like this is going to be in your, he's mad at me that I'm, that I'm potentially leaving as mayor but he's happy I'm going to be here now because we started talking about the tip wage piece of it and, and what I said to him was we, we talked back and forth about his restaurant and the concerns that I don't have with him but the concerns around the country and he said we have to do a, he said this not me we have to do a better job of talking to my I have to do a better job of talking to my colleagues around the country treating their workers workers with respect so that this doesn't become an issue of the tip wage. Um, what I'm looking forward to is working with the administration, working with you, Senator. We'll continue this conversation. We have 40 seconds left here uh, on this, on how we move forward here. Uh, if confirmed, uh, I will be, if I don't get confirmed, before I get confirmed, I'd love to talk to you more about this offline to see how we come up with some resolutions. Thank you. And representing small business uh, as a senator most recently off out of the trenches, I want to work with you and listen to what small businesses do. I think they got the same thing in mind that all of us want to do, raise wages and a good job. I love, I love my small businesses in Boston. Uh, support them. We support them throughout the pandemic. We're going to continue to support them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brown. Uh, we will turn to Senator Hassan. Well, thank you, Chair Murray, and thank you, Ranking Member Burr. Um, and thank you, Mr. Walsh, for being here today. I want to thank you and Lori for being willing to continue service because uh, it takes everybody around you, too, to make this possible, and we're really grateful. Um, I also want to thank you for mentioning to Senator Casey um, the interest that you and I have talked about around workers with disabilities, that I just want to note um, how uh, proud I am of the people of New Hampshire and the businesses of New Hampshire for being the first state in the country to outlaw the sub-minimum wage while I was governor. Um, and that was really because business leaders stepped forward and said, we value these workers. They do great work. Um, why the heck don't they get the same wages as everybody else? And I look forward to continuing to work with you on that issue. Uh, I want to turn to an issue we've talked a lot about this morning, which is how particularly uh, in the wake of this pandemic, we help workers who have lost their jobs get the skills that they need. And obviously, it's not just about post-pandemic economics. It's about workforce training generally. And we've had a lot of discussion this morning about it. I just wanted to highlight that I've reintroduced uh, the Bipartisan Gateway to Careers Act, something we talked about uh, when we spoke last week with Senators Young, Collins, and Kane. Um, and that's one that would support opportunities for workers to earn as they learn, as well as provide important supports to workers who face barriers like transportation or child care uh, assistance. I'm particularly interested as we think about this, uh, um, and you've mentioned it a little bit, how the Department of Labor can support these kinds of programs working with the Department of Education, because I think there's a lot of crossover there, so you can expand 
learning opportunities for workers who've lost their jobs. Thank you, Senator, and I look forward to working with you as I have in the past, and it's great to see you today. Um, when, you come, when it comes to job training, you, you have to work across agency lines. You have to work with commerce. We need to work with education. We need to work with higher education. Um, higher education, education schools across America have the, have the infrastructure to be able to help us really maximize the job training opportunities and the, and the efforts that we invest in job training. Uh, in, our, in the city of Boston, we've, I've worked very closely with schools like Bunker Hill Community College, Roxbury Community College, Mass Bay Community College, um, and, uh, and other community colleges on, on training and job training opportunities for young people. We've worked with on internships in our high schools. We have a very robust uh, summer job program in the city of Boston. Obviously, this year was different because of COVID, but prior to that, about 11,000 young people were employed in the tech industry, in the financial service industries, and in different industries in the city of Boston, which gave kids from the inner city the opportunity to get be exposed to a career they might otherwise never would have imagined. Having the opportunity here uh, is exciting in the Department of Labor. Um, to Chris, uh, Senator um, Murphy was talking about job training for specific industries, but there really is opportunities here, uh, and having that those crossovers need to happen. Job training is not a Republican or Democratic issue. It's not a progressive or conservative issue. Uh, you know, th there are people all across the aisles, all over wherever they are, and, and they're struggling right now. And having the ability to make an immediate impact on their outcome or their family's outcome is really important. So I think that, you know, working with, with the Senate, working with this committee, first and foremost, because you cover it all. You cover the labor, you have the education, we have an, op we have an opportunity here. But I think that working, working uh, in a, in a qu fast manner, uh, once confirmed over at DOL, I think that that's something that would be important for me and a priority that I'd want to work with you and other folks on. And then not forgetting, not, not forgetting the, the, the communities that are forgotten, like the disability community. Thank you. Uh, the recovery community yeah. uh, and other communities. So. Well, thank you. And, and you just mentioned uh, one of the other communities I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, we know we have to expand opportunities for workers who are in recovery from substance misuse, uh, an issue that is huge in my state. I know it's huge in Massachusetts and so for so many of our colleagues. Uh, we continue to grapple with the opioid epidemic often leaving individuals in recovery struggling to find their way back into the workforce. And I think there are employers who want to be helpful but maybe don't have the tools to do it. So what can we do to ensure that these workers receive the necessary supports to reenter the workforce and stay in recovery? Um, I believe in second chances, or I would not be sitting here as the nominee for Secretary of Labor. Uh, a lot of people that we talk, when you talk about substance use disorder, uh, alcoholism, addic drugs, mental health. Um, many of those people made mistakes that are held against them for their entire life. We have to do something about that. Um, I have worked with employers in the city of Boston that have been amazing, that have given people opportunities, second chances, people that have proven that they are looking for it and will work for a second chance. So I think the stigma around this as well has to be addressed uh, and, and that we have to um, we don't have enough time to get, get that deep into it, but I think stigma is something that, that we have to address as well. I, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. I am over time, so I will submit a question to the record, perhaps about retirement issues. Obviously, we need to make sure our workforce can retire with dignity, and we've got a lot of work to do there too, as well. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Hassan. I'll turn to Senator Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair, the, and Mayor Walsh, thank you for your willingness to serve without any question. You and I both share the story of redemption, perhaps in different areas, but certainly I appreciate your remarkable story, your miraculous uh, recovery, and the fact that you are very passionate about the country that you live in, and the, being a mayor, I, I spent 13 years in local government, so I certainly appreciate uh, the commitment that it takes uh, and the tenacity that it takes to, to do what you've done, and I thank you for doing it. I thank you for your willingness to serve. Uh, in the Department of Labor as a secretary. I know that you and I will find some common ground, perhaps on uh, workforce development. There are other areas where we will have passionate disagreements, and you've already stated your support for the PRO Act and the recovery plan, and those are two areas that we're going to have passionate disagreements. Uh, I come from a state like 27 other states in this nation 
that have right to work laws. South Carolina became a right to work state in 1954. We have thousands upon thousands of employees who are members of unions. It is their right in South Carolina. We protect their right to unionize. What I am very concerned about with the PRO Act is that overnight, those 27 states lose their ability to be right to work states. That is devastating for the economic future of this nation, devastating for those employees within those states, and frankly, uh, a bad decision and a poor start for this administration, especially when you think about the fact from 2001 to 2016, right to work states saw somewhere around 27 percent of growth of jobs in their states, and I believe it was somewhere near a 10-point increase in personal income in those same states during the same time period. And at the same time, we were able to drive unemployment down precipitously. So if you can have more jobs making more money with lower unemployment, that sounds like a recipe for this nation. Unfortunately, the PRO Act literally overnight squashes the dreams of millions of people living in those 27 states. Uh, I'm a guy who believes that we can continue to continue in the path of high-tech manufacturing. That's what South Carolina has become the champion of. Five major tire companies all call their homes in South Carolina. Uh, BMW, Volvo, Mercedes, Boeing, all call their homes in South Carolina. And that story is throughout the nation. Uh, so when we think about stopping the right of states to be right to work, when we think about uh, having contracts that force workers to pay union dues just to get a job, when we think about undermining secret ballot elections and restoring the Browning Ferris standard for joint employers that will cost franchising sector $33 billion a year, hundreds of thousands of jobs. The PRO Act is a place where you and I will have strong, passionate disagreements. And my ask of you is to make sure that with a 50-50 Senate, nearly a 50%, 50% House, that you agree to talk with both sides be before moving forward and undermining the rights of those states as well. I hope that you can... Uh, I'd love for you to change your mind on the pro act. I don't think you will, but I hope that you will come to both sides to have a conversation about how to move forward with something that will be devastating to states like my home state of South Carolina. Is that something you can commit to? Absolutely, Mayor? absolutely, Senator. Um, that's something Thank I'm you. proud to do. I, I am. I, I generally like to be a collaborator. Uh, I yes, absolutely sir. will not surprise you. I, I would love to keep those dialogues going. I've done that my whole entire career. I appreciate that, sir. And, and I know that you and I will, as we look at the recovery plan, perhaps not agree on the minimum wage either. But this, this is another example of bad policy, perhaps with good intention. Uh, raising the minimum wage from where it is now to $15 an hour uh, will shutter, kill, destroy somewhere near 4 million jobs. CBO says upwards of 3.7 million jobs lost, and I think that translates into about $9 billion of personal income that vanishes, vanishes. So increasing the minimum wage actually destroys income uh, and a net loss for America. I hope we have an opportunity to recalibrate that, and I, and I heard, heard your conversation on tip wages. I will simply say I've been visiting restaurants in South Carolina and in D.C., one thing that servers and bartenders have in common, they hate the concept of losing their tips. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much, Senator Scott, and we will turn to Senator Smith. Thank you, Madam Chair, and also thank you, Ranking Member Burr, for this hearing, and Mayor Walsh, congratulations, and I want to thank you for your service and your willingness to take on this really important job. You know, we had a great conversation, and I appreciate shared stories from uh, City Hall, where I was chief of staff, and I we joke that when you're mayor, there is no job that is too big or too small for a mayor to undertake, and also, you know, the, the cliche is that potholes aren't 
political. And I think that that is true, though. There are most issues that you deal with in the mayor's office aren't partisan. And I can hear in your answers today and your responses to folks across the aisle uh, that sort of problem-solving spirit that I think mayors tend to have. So I want to thank you. I also am really interested and uh, so glad for your background, your family background um, in organized labor. You know, when I was 18, I joined the union so that I could go and work on the Trans-Alaska Pipeline um, in order to help pay uh, for college. And um, I have seen firsthand, as I know that you have in your family, that the right to come together and to organize collectively for better working conditions, better wages, for safer workplaces, is um, is a powerful, powerful thing, and it lifts everybody up. It, as my mentor in Minnesota, Paul Wellstone, says, um, it makes it possible so that when we, we all do better, when we all do better. So with that spirit, I was thinking this weekend, I visited the um, picket line of Teamsters Local 120, who were picketing outside of Marathon Oil, fighting as hard as they can for a safe workplace, not only for themselves, but also for the surrounding community and the families that live less than a football field away from that refinery, a place that has the potential to be just as dangerous as the Husky refinery that exploded in Wisconsin. So your job here to help make sure that we have safe workplaces feels so important to me and, and very, um, very tangible and in the moment. I want to ask you a little bit about that, um, Mayor Walsh. We know that wage theft and unsafe working conditions continue to plague working people in this country, and that too often we don't treat wage theft the way we treat other kinds of theft, even though it steals money out of the pockets of working people every single day. And in 2013, this committee, an investigation by this committee, discovered that over a five-year period, 42 workers were killed on the job because of violations of worker safety laws at companies with federal contracts. And in that same period, 32 of the largest 100 wage theft penalties were assessed against federal contractors. So I think as federal uh, leaders, we have a responsibility to address this. And I want to ask you, will you take steps to hold federal contractors accountable for dangerous work sites, for stealing wages, or for discrimination? Thank you very much, Senator. Let me just, just really quickly address what you said a little earlier. No worker in this country should have to take a, go to a picket line walk off the job or quit because of safety regulations inside their, their companies. That, that should just not happen. Uh, and I think it's important that if we talk about many of the senators today talked, brought up OSHA and we talked about, had a little conversation about OSHA, um, federal, federal contracted employee, federal contracts that we give out uh, should follow the rules and regulations as well, whether it's paying fair wages, whether it's respecting the rights of workers, whether it's making sure that we have safe work conditions today with um, due to COVID, but tomorrow due to other situations. So yes, I commit to support working with you, but working with the department, more importantly, uh, to make sure that, that these contracts are appropriately, appropriately carried out and workers, um, workers' regulations are followed and rules are followed and safety is followed and, 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 and pay equity is followed and everything that's important. Again, it's taxpayers' money in these contracts. Um, we need to spend them at the best way we can spend them. Well, I really appreciate that, Mayor. I couldn't agree with you more, and I look forward to working with you on that. I have a bill to help make clear that responsibility that we have, and I'd love to work with you on that. Um, I want to also just, I've just got a couple minutes left. I want to uh, mention to you that I look forward to working with you on the great challenges we have with multi-employer pensions. I think we spoke briefly about this when you and I spoke. You know, during my first weekend as senator, I traveled to Duluth to talk with the Teamsters again about their deep worries about losing their pensions. This is a worry not only for them, but for the businesses that they work for. They did everything right, that paid into their pensions, only to find that now it might not be, for, be there for them. And I'll never forget Vicki, who I met there, who said, Tina, I don't have a plan B if I lose my pension. So this is something that I, I really believe that we can work on together, and I look forward to that. And I'm just out of time, uh, Madam uh, Chair, but I want to also mention quickly that in Minnesota, we need your help 
um, to make sure that high school students are eligible to access the pandemic unemployment insurance program. They have been saving money to help pay for their families. This is something that we can do, and I would love to work with you on that as well, Mayor Walsh. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Smith. Uh, we will turn to Senator Tuberville. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Mayor, welcome. Thank you, I've had several jobs in my lifetime and had to go through this as a coach, so <laughs> uh, I know what you're going through, but, but welcome. Uh, most people have gone through all my questions. I just want to reiterate, re reiterate some things that you said and get kind of your response. You know, being in, being in education business 40 years and being around kids that have gone to college and coming out of high school, as you said, a lot of these kids don't need, need to go to a four-year school. They don't need to go. They need to go get a job, but they need to go be trained for a job. And I've learned over my career that uh, just saying that we're going to go to a community college or going to a junior college doesn't work. We're gonna, we need to start in the high schools. We need to start them in vocational areas in the high schools. I know when I came through high school, I had vocation classes, and I got interested in electricity and learned a lot about electricity over the years. Fortunately, went into coaching and, and did pretty well. But uh, I just want to get your thoughts. Being in education, of course, this is an education question, but I hope when you finish your tenure in this new job that people know your name. Know your name as somebody that really got people into a business or a field that they wanted to get into where they could raise a family and make money. And that that's the whole part of life. And uh, I just want to ask you, what do you think your goal is of really getting kids, not just in community college, but in high school, involved in a, in a real job, something to use their hands? No, thank you. Um, thank you for that, and thank you for your comment. I, you know, you, you saw in your lived experience um, young people that you played, played for you that if they didn't have that desire for the game, they probably wouldn't be in college. We need to get that same type of desire in young people in the trades, like you mentioned about electricity or whatever it might be. We need to do a lot better job, I think. I'll speak for Boston because um, I've, I've seen it. We need to do a lot better job around vocational training. We need to do a lot better job around creating pathways and opportunities for young people. People don't know what they're passionate about. When, when I was 17, I didn't really know what my passion was. You know, I, I ended up going to work and laboring because my father was a laborer. I went laboring with him. Uh, my father wanted me to put a suit and tie on when they got older. Um, so I agree with what you've lived and you've seen as an opportunity. How do we translate that into the work that I've done into programs that we can put all across America into every high school and community college? I think that that's what we need to do. We have, we have, there's millions and millions and millions of young people right now that if we don't take action soon, they're never going to get into the middle class. They're never going to have an opportunity because they're, they're never going to have a chance to be, be helped and, and given guidance on what they want to do. So how do I do that? Um, I think we work collectively together uh, across the aisle. I think we listen to ideas and share best practices. I think that we work with the Secretary of Education uh, to talk about policies that can be put into play during the Department of Education. I think we talk to colleges across this country as well because they're interested in it as well. I think that we, we, we put together, maybe we put together a task force to talk about how do we create people for the, the American 21st century recovery, kind of as, as President Biden talks, build back better. Well, we build back better. Let's, let's create something, build back better for, for high schoolers right now. So, so as we're building back better, they're part of building it. Education is the key to freedom. Yeah. And we've got to get these kids away from these computers and, and PlayStation games and get them to use their hands and really understand they got to go to work for a living one of these days. And uh, I appreciate your comments on that. You know, in Alabama, we're a right to work state. Next week, uh, Amazon's got 6,000 people voting on a uh, proposal to whether unionize or not unionize. And we've had several big manufacturing uh, uh, jobs in our state that has turned it down. Uh, what advice would you give to them when, when they go to vote next week? What can a union do for them that hadn't done much in, in, in Alabama? I don't know if that's my place to be able to say that, but I think you vote your heart. You listen to the what, what's you listen to if there's both sides in the conversation. I think that the key, the key, and the key to the Pro Act, and 
is that you have the right to organize. And everyone has the right to organize. Everyone should be able to, if they choose to organize, uh, they organize in the union that, that they organize with will have the opportunity to go in and negotiate good salary, good wages, good benefits, and working conditions, all that stuff. I think that, you know, for, uh, for the workers, I'm not as familiar with, with what's going on in Alabama with Amazon, but I know that the workers, I know there's been a lot of interest in workers wanting to be covered by a union because they felt some of the um, disparities that they've felt on the job site. I would just hope that uh, in this job, though, you wouldn't feel the need to put your hand on the scale at all to, to convince people to do whatever because uh, we've been we've we've had pretty su good success with it but uh mayor good luck to you and Thank again you. i hope people know your name quite often in the next few years because this infrastructure bill that's coming down the pipe we're going to need people to work it's not going to happen with money it's going to happen with workers and uh, you're going to be a big part of that so thank you very much for your time and uh thank you thank you madam chairman thank you Santa. thank you senator tuberville we'll turn to senator rosen uh, thank you, Madam Chairwoman and Ranking Member Burr. Appreciate uh, uh, the work here today. And Mayor Walsh, thank you for being with us, for all of your answers, your commitment to serving your community and, and your nation. I really appreciated the productive meeting that we had. I uh, look forward to learning about your plans. We're going to support working families, revive our nation's economy, create jobs, and of course, train America's workforce to everybody's point because my state of Nevada, working families, like every state, they're the backbone of Nevada. Our strong labor unions are what make us a world-class hospitality center, entertainment, our stages, tourism, our tourism-based economy. It's all of that possible because of our labor unions. So in this global pandemic, it's just devastated our workforce. It's led to record unemployment. I urge this committee swift nomination of uh, Mayor Walsh so we can get to work. But uh, COVID-19 has devastated communities across this country. It's strained the system that we use to deliver relief to struggling families. In my home state of Nevada, we've seen one of the highest rates of unemployment. December, December of last year, 1.5 million initial unemployment claims have been filed since the start of the pandemic. Our state unemployment agency went from processing 20,000 claims a week and uh, each week in February 2020 to more than 300,000 by August, from 20,000 to 300,000. And so I'm grateful to all of our agents, agency employees who work nights and weekends to plow through all of that to get the benefits out to Nevadans. But I'm frustrated that it took so long to get that financial support out. Um, our personnel had to use uh, outdated technology and without adequate federal uh, government support. So, uh, Mr. Walsh, uh, how can the Department of Labor really support our state unemployment agencies for weathering this crisis? They're going to continue to weather this so they can get the workers uh, quickly and efficiently, benefits they're entitled. How do we invest in technology upgrades to make this happen across all 50 states? Thank you very much, Senator. And, um the first way we do it is by working collaboratively together uh, with the Senate and the Congress um, to think about where, what the commitment is to upgrading the technology system. Uh, I know that in Massachusetts, we're one of, I believe, there's 30 states that have upgraded the technology over the last decade uh, for the UI system, but that system, again, probably needs an upgrading again. Uh, when I became the mayor of Boston in 2014, 13, got elected 14, became the mayor, uh, we started to invest in technology and IT. We started to invest on the capital side of IT. Uh, and, you know, we've made, we've made investments in our, in our, with the police and fire, with their radio systems. We've made investments across the board. And uh, really what we have to do uh, is make further investments as a, as a government uh, in technology. Um, you know, UI is one of those areas that obviously is a big spotlight on today and shows one of the glaring shortfalls, if you will, in technology for government as a whole. But there are many other areas that there's a shortfall as well in technology for government as a whole. I, I can't speak really um, articulately about the federal government yet uh, because I'm not here yet. Uh, but I'm just making an assumption that with the federal government's IT system is no further along than states and cities all across this country. <laughs> So I really think that we have to work collaboratively together uh, to, 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 to fix a system that, that needs upgrading. I know that 
I know that this would, will be, is a priority as well of the president and the vice president, uh, and certainly of, of all the folks. You know, we bring all these young people into work in government, and when they get here, they kind of they laugh at the, the, where we are as far as technology is. Uh, so maybe we should start listening to some of these young people around us to understand how do we advance our technology better. Uh, you know, Ranking Member Burr is looking at me now, shaking his head, so the two of us, we're kind of on the same page, I think, right now. Well, I want to keep on this vein, because I'm actually a former computer programmer and systems yes, analyst. I kind of make the joke, I was an applications programmer. I wrote apps before they were called apps, but I'm passionate about improving our IT and our STEM workforce and our cyber workforce. They're good-paying jobs right now that are available, more than half a million at least uh, across this country. And, of course, we've seen many cyber attacks that they're crippling our schools, our hospitals. I know you've seen that, the ransomware attacks, solar winds attacks. So, again, working on this theme of IT and, and security, uh, I was hoping that you would uh, commit to really helping us build this technology workforce and cyber strength within our Department of Labor to protect uh, all of that. And so uh, I was hoping you'll commit to work on that with us um, as well. No, absolutely, Senator. Uh, and, and that certainly will make our, our agency more efficient and be able to carry out work on behalf of workers uh, more effectively. And, you know, I, I forgot for a moment there that you and I spoke the other day about technology. So certainly you have a better knowledge than, than I do on this and, and that a lot of people have on this. But I do think if we can become an agency that, that is more effective uh, both on, on the ground level with, with OSHA requirements but also with technology, it will only help and advance the American work and the American industry. Well, I want to, uh, just as I close, we're going to try to get those apprenticeships, internships, returnships, all the things we talked about to get people trained into these great, good-paying jobs that will move us forward. So uh, thank you. I've expired my time. Thank you, Senator Rosen. And we will turn to Senator Lujan. Thank you so much, Chairwoman Murray, and also Ranking Member Burr for holding this hearing today. And thank you to Mayor Walsh for joining us today, sir. Um, congratulations on your nomination. And I look forward to working with you to increase wages and expand apprenticeships and technical training programs and strengthen worker protections. Um, Mayor Walsh, my father, uh, my late father was a union iron worker. My late grandfather, a union carpenter. My brother is uh, IBW. Um, so as you may guess, I'm a strong supporter of Davis-Bacon protections, which provide workers with fair family-sustaining wages. However, I've heard some concerns that the inclusion of unnecessary laborer and craftsman subcategories in the Department of Labor's vocational surveys undermines the ability to establish a fair wage. Um, Mayor Walsh, if confirmed, will you commit to working with me to address these issues in the wage categories, take a look at them, and within the wage survey process? No, absolutely, Senator. I, I would love to, to work with you on that. I, to be honest with you, I don't have a lot of information on it right now, so uh, it's an area that, that um, obviously right off the bat, if confirmed, love to get together with you sooner rather than later. Appreciate that, sir. And what steps would you take to ensure robust enforcement of Davis-Bacon? So say that I missed the last part of that question, sorry. What steps would you take to ensure robust enforcement of Davis-Bacon? I mean, I, I think w when it comes to Davis-Bacon prevailing wage, we have to make sure that, that we are, uh, again, I go back to the statement I made earlier, these dollars that are in Davis-Bacon or prevailing wage, uh, th this is federal money that we're, we're, we're paying uh, to do contracting with. So we need to make sure that if, if we have regulation that says the money is going to pay the worker and is going to, you know, obviously do the project that, that they're being paid for, uh, it's important that we enforce that. Uh, so, you know, Davis Bacon, as you know, I mean, my father was a laborer, my brother's a laborer, my family's a laborer. Uh, many of the projects that they've worked on over the years, some of those projects have been Davis Bacon, Dave, Davis Bacon. Uh, but there were parts of this country, I know there's some concerns about the Davis Bacon uh, not being enforced. Uh, so I will do everything I can to make sure that uh, it, Davis Bacon's enforced, but also it's, about, it's also about protecting the American um, workers' uh, uh, money because it's taxpayers' money. I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor. And as you know, and you just eloquently uh, shared, 
and the questions that we've had from other uh, colleagues on the committee, wage theft impacts workers across all industries, and it especially impacts low wage workers. And I appreciate your background and that of your family, and that's why I have great faith that you're going to be a strong Secretary of Labor. Um, and I know that you appreciate the importance of protecting the wages of working men and women, and have really appreciated what I've learned about your work as mayor, where you did take steps to ensure that the city contractors abided by fair wage and hour laws, and that's something you'll bring to the Department of Labor. Um, Mr. Mayor, one area that I wanted to raise that matters to us in New Mexico is a program uh, with the acronym EEOICPA. Uh, 75 years ago, Mr. Mayor, the Trinity test site in New Mexico became ground zero for the detonation of the first atomic bomb. While this day demonstrated America's scientific leadership, it also marked the beginning of a history of illness and suffering that has spanned generations due to radiation exposure. That's why I've been a proud champion and really appreciate the work of our chairwoman, Chairwoman Murray, um, on these important programs. Senator Udall, who I succeeded in the Senate, and his father worked on an initiative called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act Amendments to recognize and to compensate all the downwinders and uranium miners for their participation in America's national security. These are folks, Mr. Mayor, that lived in proximity to where that work and research took place, and they were downwind. Some counties in some states in America received protections, but others, like New Mexico, where the bomb actually went off, were left out. But it's also why I have been a strong supporter of the Energy Employees Occupational Illness Compensation Program Act, which protects the interests of federal energy researchers, workers, contractors who were injured, became ill on the job, many due to radiation exposure. And that's why we lost my dad. My dad got sick on the job because he didn't have those protections. And I committed to him and to my mom that I would do everything that I can to make sure other families don't have to go through what he experienced. If confirmed, uh, Mr. Mayor, what will you do to strengthen the program's outreach efforts to learn about it and to ensure timely determinations of eligibility so that those who were made sick or died are compensated? Yeah, the, Senator, the first thing I'll say quickly on that is we have to put the safety protocol in place on the front end and not the back end. Uh, you know, my father as well, um, when he passed away, uh, before he died, 25% of his lung was working because of, of working on job sites, breathing in asbestos, and working with dirt and soot and everything else. So I, I, my commitment to you, first and foremost, is to put rules and regulations in place that actually protect the worker up front so that, that when they become parents and, grand, and grandparents, that, that then they're not struggling. Uh, I will absolutely be willing to eager to sit down with you and talk to you about what enforcement we can do moving forward and how we can help not just the, the current American worker, but the past worker as well. And Chairwoman Murray, as I yield back my time, I also thank you for your leadership on this issue. Um, it saves people's lives, as you know, and it helps families. So just thank you and appreciate uh, your response there, Mr. Mayor. I look forward to working with all of you. Thank you so much. I yield Thanks. back. Thanks, Senator. Thank you, Senator Lohan. Look forward to working with you on that as well. Uh, Senator Hickenlooper. Thank you, Chairwoman Murray. Uh, I appreciate uh, being allowed to participate in this. Ranking Member Burr, appreciate your com comments as well. Uh, Mayor Walsh, what a, uh, what a pleasure to uh, get to meet you, even if it's only virtually at this moment. Uh, as you probably know, I'm a small business person myself, but I'm also a, a former mayor, and I'm very eager to see you confirmed, uh, and then you can have to address that question that so many mayors get asked was, was being mayor the greatest job you ever had uh, in your life? Uh, I have two quick questions for you. I uh, started out as a geologist and, and got laid off in the mid 80s and was out of work for a couple of years and ended up opening uh, one of the first blue pubs in the country and then a, bump, a, a number of other ones. We had up about 14. I tell my wife that I had a, uh, an empire. It was a very, very small empire, but an empire nonetheless. Uh, and my older brother was an automobile mechanic most of his life. Uh, my sister was a school teacher her whole life. I have, a, uh, I think, a sense of the, the needs of, of, of small business and, and how so many of these uh, professions depend upon uh, education. But they also, especially small businesses, need to, to get support. Uh, and I think in many cases, uh, 
almost uh, not just encouragement, but uh, have the, the incentives lined up properly so they can compete with the larger companies. A lot of, there's a lot of discussion around COVID with the DPA, uh, the Defense Production Act. And in that specifically, there are, there's language to really promote small businesses that they participate uh, when DPA is invoked and utilized. Uh, are you, have you been looking at that and, and do you have any ideas about how to make sure that small businesses get their share of, of those, of that work? Yeah, thank you, Senator, or maybe I should call you Mr. Mayor. Uh, I think once you're mayor, you're always a mayor. So thank you for that question, Mayor. Um, you know, what, what we've done in the city of Boston during this time was in some places we did ease regulations. Um, we ease regulations to have outdoor dining for restaurants. Uh, we worked with the city, um, through the city with some grant programs to buy PPE. Uh, we created a program in the city of Boston not too long ago to help small businesses with their rent. Uh, we've worked, we're working with them in different ways, and, and uh, I think that as we think about moving forward here, people have different definitions of small businesses, but when I'm talking about small business, I think what you're talking about small businesses is, is the businesses that are on our main streets right now all across America that are struggling. And so I certainly look forward to, to working um, with economic development, with you, with other folks on how do we create opportunities so we can keep our small businesses alive. Those small businesses employ lots and lots, millions and millions of Americans. Uh, and if we don't do something to continue to support our small businesses, I know uh, in the American uh, Rescue Plan there's a component in that, but if we don't do something to support our small businesses or have those small businesses come back uh, during this COVID time and after COVID, uh, we're going to have bigger challenges in America to, to rebound our economy. Thank you. We agree on that. Uh, also, as a former mayor, we share the experience of working with and around the issues of workforce uh, and recognize <laughs> worker shortages, in the, the ebb and flow of, of the workforce, and also the importance of supporting senior citizens and keeping them in their homes. Yeah. And it seems like we could be addressing both of these issues at the same time, uh, if we can help reduce workforce bias against seniors and help them find and stay in jobs that, uh, that offer them meaningful work. So as uh, workforce demands ebb and flow, do you have experiences as a mayor or, or ideas about how to kind of address this pro problem, uh, address bias and, and help get and keep uh, seniors in the workforce? Yeah, I, I think that one of the things we have to do, and I don't have all the federal rules and regulations, but we have to look and see how do we create opportunities for seniors to be able to um, do programs that can get benefits. So, for example, in Boston, we have a program in the city of Boston where seniors can do volunteering, uh, and we give them some, uh, some, some credit on their taxes. Uh, it doesn't impact their retirements. It doesn't impact their Social Security. They have small hours they can work. We should be looking at those opportunities uh, is how can we enhance opportunities for seniors to make some money, even seniors that might be getting a very modest retirement or a very modest Social Security check. Because one of, one, one of the problems I see every day is that seniors have to make decisions whether to eat or pay prescription drugs. That's a real thing. Uh, that's not just something that elected officials say. That's a real thing. I've seen it fr fr uh, I've seen it up front and personal in the city of Boston. So I would love to be work as the Department of Labor, Workforce Development, work with all of you to be creative on what we can do to, to allow opportunities for our seniors so that seniors um, that, that are sitting in their home, maybe watching this today, um, that are struggling, that aren't always talked about. Um, we, need to, we need to do more than talk about it. We need to take action. Well, thank you. We agree, and I look forward to working with you on that. I think we're out of time. And I will look forward to, in a future time to discuss uh, apprenticeships like Senator Tuberville mentioned, but also those apprenticeships that start in high school and really are not just with trades, but with, with every type of, of, of job and profession. Uh, that's a future discussion. Thank you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator Hickenlooper. That does complete our first round of questions. Uh, so, Senator Burr, I will turn to you for any additional questions or comments before I do my final. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I've just got a little housekeeping to do. Mayor, thank you for being here today. Thank you for either answering or attempting to answer or promising to get back with members on all their questions. I'm sure when you leave here today, you're going to think, 
is it too late for me to back out? Let me ask you a question. <laughs> it is too late. You're too far. I'm going to ask you six questions. The answer to each of them is yes. Oversight is an important function of Congress, and hopefully that can be done in a bipartisan way. But if not, I intend to exercise my oversight authority as ranking member of this committee, just as Senator Murray did as ranking member. Question one, do you commit to providing me and my staff with the information that I or other minority members of the committee request of the Department of Labor within the requested time frame? Yes. Do you commit to providing me and my staff with the documents I or other minority members of the committee request from the Department of Labor within the timeline? Yes. Do you commit to providing me and my staff or other minority members of the committee with briefings requesting request from you and your staff within the requested timeline? Yes. Do you commit to providing the Department of Labor Inspector General and the General Accounting Office with any information, briefings, and documents they might request? Yes. Do you commit to testifying when called before a congressional committee? Absolutely. Mayor, Anytime. Mayor thank you for being here. I look forward to uh, the chairman uh, expediting your uh, confirmation and look forward to supporting you. Thank you. Ranking Thank you, Madam Burr. Chairman. Th thank you very much, Senator Burr. And I have a couple additional questions and comments, uh, Mayor, and thank you again for um, all of your willingness to be here today. Um, since the beginning of the pandemic, we have seen staggering levels of unemployment, including 22 million jobs lost at the height of this pandemic. While some jobs have returned, there are still 9 million fewer individuals working today than there was a year ago. And those individuals are disproportionately workers of color, immigrants, and workers with a high school diploma or less. President Biden has pledged significant investments to restart the economy and create quality jobs for individuals who are experience, experiencing under, un, unemployment or underemployment due to the pandemic. And as we make investments in our key sectors, we have to also invest in workforce training programs that lead to quality credentials. And we need to eliminate barriers to make sure anyone who needs training opportunities can get them. So, Mayor Walsh, with respect to job training and apprenticeships, what would be your priorities at the Department of Labor to support an inclusive rec recovery so all types of workers experiencing unemployment or underemployment have pathways to quality jobs? Thank you, Senator. Uh, Madam Chair, I, I, that question, uh, obviously, as you know, came up a few times today. I think it's really important that uh, we begin to continue to invest in recovery in this country. Uh, President Biden's um, his plan of building back better uh, is going to take significant investments on the workforce development side of it. Uh, many of those jobs that the American people had previous to COVID uh, might not be coming back, and we know that. We also have to look at how do we train older American workers that uh, might have been out of the workforce for a while, but due to COVID have to come into the workforce or working in an industry that's gone. So. Uh, that has that needs to be a priority of the of the department uh, as soon as uh, if confirmed I get there. And I know they're working on it now, but really put a, a stronger emphasis on it uh, when I get there. Okay, thank you. And I'm also really deeply worried about the multi-employer pension crisis in this country. Nearly one and a half million people rely on about 120 multi-employer pension funds that are in dire financial straits and expected to go bankrupt very soon. On top of that, the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation, which provides extra security for retirees when plans go bankrupt, is also projected to become insolvent, insolvent by 2026. So if the PBGC fails, it will throw the financial security of millions of workers and retirees into jeopardy. If those funds fail, not only will millions of Americans face economic devastation, but it will also be catastrophic for the thousands of employers particularly small businesses who are trying to do right by their workers. So this is an urgent crisis that really needs a swift, swift resolution. Mayor Walsh, I just wanted to ask you, will you commit to working with me to address that critical issue? Senator, I absolutely do commit to working with you. And, and this is, uh, this is a, one of the largest crises of the moment. Uh, and I feel that it's our obligation as a government uh, to protect workers and protect their futures. And by protecting their futures meaning means protecting their, their pensions uh, that their hard-earned dollars earned, that they worked for to get at the end of their work career. 
Thank you. And now before I wrap up, I just wanted to take this opportunity to talk about another especially important issue, one that Mayor Walsh is very familiar with, organizing, collective bargaining, and the benefits of unionization. Union workers built the American middle class. Joining a union empowers workers to bargain for fair wages, better benefits, and safe working conditions, all of which are workplace issues of critical importance during this COVID-19 pandemic. Moreover, a union means workers are treated with the respect and dignity that they're often denied. For decades, unions have been under attack by corporate special interests, which put margins over people, profit margins over people. And the law that was meant to protect workers' right to democracy in the workplace, the National Labor Relations Act, is in desperate need of revision. The Protecting the Right to Organize Act, called the PRO Act, would ensure workers' fundamental rights are respected. The PRO Act provides for fairer union election procedures, meaningful remedies when employers break the law, and other updates to bring the NLRA into the 21st century. This law is critical for every worker, but especially for women and workers of color who disproportionately have jobs with lower wages and fewer, if any, benefits. Passing the PRO Act is not just a labor issue, it is an equity issue. Mayor Walsh, I know from your own experience, you truly know the full value of collective bargaining and what is meant to a worker to have a union by his or her side. And I look forward to working with you and the Biden administration as true partners in protecting the right to organize. Thank you, Chair Omari. I, I look forward to working with you on that as well and, and members of this committee and the entire uh, House and Senate. Thank you. Thank you very much. That will end our hearing for today, and I appreciate the participation of the members of this committee. Mayor Walsh, thank you for answering all of our questions and sharing your experience and your insights with us. I look forward to working with you as we tackle the immense challenges facing our workers, our retirees, and our families across the country. So for any senators who wish to ask additional questions of the nominee, Questions for the record will be due by Friday, February 5th at 5 p.m. The hearing record will remain open for 10 days for members who wish to submit additional materials for the record. It is my intention to schedule a vote in committee on Mayor Walsh's nomination as quickly as possible so we can move his nomination forward 